Well, we are in the Gospel of Luke, our study, which we began uh, back in April. Uh, we're continuing on, and uh, we're working our way through the early part of the Gospel of Luke. So I invite you to open your Bibles to Luke chapter 2, and uh, you have your uh, outlines, uh, your handouts uh, given, and uh, let's commit it to the Lord, and we will begin today. Father, thank you for the opportunity to, to fellowship together in the word of God. You give us the scripture to teach us, to guide us, to instruct us, to inform our faith, to reveal to us the precious and great promises of God, in which is our home, in which we have, through which we have found the blessings of the grace of the Lord Jesus. We pray for your guidance in this time today as we look upon a scripture that's familiar to us in many ways, and yet we desire to see that which you are presenting to us and which you guide us to understand that which you grant to us in the Gospel of Luke. So, Lord, we commit it to you. We pray for your blessing in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, as I said, we're in a very familiar passage of Scripture. This is not a uh, strange passage to you. This is the passage that we hear and read and repeat uh, every Christmas. This is the famous Christmas story as Luke has presented it to us. And um, we're going to look at two aspects of this, um, the very familiar birth of Jesus in Bethlehem and uh, what took place there with angelic revelation. So we'll start here. We'll read uh, the passage in Luke chapter 2, verses 1 to 7. We'll look at that first, and then we'll go on to um, the passage on the shepherds, um, and uh, we'll take it uh, bit by bit here. So Luke chapter 2, verse 1, In those days a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. This was the first registration when Quirinius was governor of Syria, and all went to be registered, each to his own town. And Joseph also went up from Galilee, from the town of Nazareth, to Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David, to be registered with Mary, his betrothed, who was with child. And while they were there, the time came for her to give birth, and she gave birth to her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling cloths and laid him in a manger because there was no place for them in the inn. In this very familiar passage, we begin Luke um, noting where we are in history at that time, the imperial history, the Roman history. It was a time when Caesar Augustus, um, Augustus was the Caesar of Rome. Interesting, just a little background. We're, we're not unfamiliar with these times in Roman history, thanks to a number of Roman historians and uh, and Shakespeare and Hollywood were familiar with a lot of what was going on here. Uh, this particular ruler, Augustus, was the uh, nephew, the grandnephew, actually an adopted son of Julius Caesar. And we all know of Julius Caesar and uh, the famous assassination of Caesar, which uh, Shakespeare wrote about, which took place in 44 BC on the Ides of March. Caesar um, crossed the Rubicon into Rome um, and was well known for his uh, exercise of power. He was given the title of dictator uh, in Rome. Rome was a republic uh, ruled by a Senate, but we had these very powerful generals and uh, Caesar uh, coming into Rome and um, defeating opposing powers, uh, assumed autocratic power, but he, he was not called a king, <clears throat> nor was he called an emperor. It was rather this person, Augustus, who was the first emperor of Rome. Uh, he was uh, born uh, Gaius um, Octavius, 
and we know him as Octavian. As I said, he was the nephew of Caesar, of Julius Caesar, and um, he was uh, Caesar's uh, adopted son and uh, consequently designated heir. When Caesar was assassinated, um, Octavius was only 21 years old, and yet um, he and Mark Anthony, who was a supporter of Caesar, uh, assumed command of legions and um, engaged Brutus and Cassius, who had assassinated uh, Julius Caesar, and defeated them. There was a triumvirate uh, formed of uh, rulership in Rome, which quickly became just two. It was this one, Octavius and Mark Anthony, uh, who were the primary powers in Rome. Uh, Anthony went to Egypt, and there's the whole story of Anthony and Cleopatra, okay? And, uh, but uh, eventually they collided, and Octavius um, prevailed uh, in the Battle of Actium in 31 BC, and then in 30, um, Anthony and Cleopatra died, and Octavian was the sole ruler of Rome. In 27 BC, the Roman Senate gave him the name Augustus. And so he had a really long name by that time. He was Gaius, and then he adopted the name of his father, Julius Caesar, Gaius Julius Caesar Augustus. And uh, then he himself gave himself the title emperor. <laughs> and from that point on, Rome had emperors. Uh, so um, this is your first emperor here of Rome, Caesar Augustus. And he ruled for over 40 years, the longest of the emperors. When you read the history of Rome, it's pretty sordid, uh, the, the, the emperors that followed him. And um, they didn't all last that long. It was very violent. But this guy brought about a peace, which we refer to as the, the Pax Romana, the peace of the Roman Empire, during his reign. He uh, did a number of things, but where we are right here is it's 4 B.C., and he's been ruling since 27 BC, and he will die in uh, 14 um, AD. So as we're in the middle of his reign, he's the emperor, and he has sent out a decree that the world should be registered. This registration is for taxation purposes. What we can tell from the histories is that um, the Roman Empire at this time was conducting censuses in various regions, not all at the same time, but uh, in accordance with the needs and particular customs of that area. This census was carried out according to Jewish custom, which meant that people had to be registered in their ancestral towns. And um, so... Uh, they sent out this registration because it seems, we don't know exactly why, well, they wanted taxes, okay, so that's why. Uh, they wanted to make sure that we have the tax rolls correct. Worry about the voting roll, make sure the tax roll is correct, okay, correct. So, um, but during this year, 4 BC, Herod, as you know, was the king and, and he will die this year. And he apparently is aware that he's coming to the end of the life because he changed his will three times during this year, okay? Now, for Herod, since he was the king of Judea and Samaria and, and up part of Syria and so on, the domain of his kingdom, <clears throat> he ruled by the will of the emperor. And to change his will, he had to have the approval of the emperor, which meant that if he changed it three times, he was sending it up there to the emperor, telling him, I'm changing it again, and will you approve this? It would raise a little bit of suspicion. <laughs> We're about to have a transition down in Judea, 
And this transition is sort of, you know, certainly not going to be allowed to happen on its own. It's going to have to have approval. And it would seem that Rome was concerned that whatever happens here in transition, well, we'll make sure we know who's down there. And uh, we want to have the census right. We want to have the tax rolls right. Because somebody else is going to have to be collecting these taxes. Now, it says this was uh, the first, the, the text of your translation reads, this was the first registration when Quirinius was governor of Syria. All went to be registered to his own town. A lot of the commentary um, on this verse is taken up with that, this person, Quirinius, and this census. For about, well, for over 200 years, there has been in modern times a controversy about the history of this. What we know of Quirinius is we have a specific date on him coming from Josephus that he became the governor of Syria 37 years after the death of, um, of after the after the death of Anthony. Now that puts you in six AD. And um, we actually have Luke referencing a census that took place in 6 AD in Acts chapter 5. Luke makes reference to this census that took place. Quirinius was the governor. And the reason is, is because it provoked a lot of reaction. There were riots. So <clears throat> when Luke refers to it in the book of Acts, it's because his readers all knew about it. And it's a, it's a key historical point. We, however, right here are in 4 BC, not 6 AD. We're 10 years earlier. And um, the, the historical question is, we don't have any evidence of Quirinius being the governor of Syria in 4 BC. He was a Roman, um, you know, official. And he could have been dispatched to Judea, to Judea to conduct a census. We just don't have any other information on that. So a lot of discussion about this, you know. You know, what was actually going on? Part of the problem is that Luke is very brief here. In fact, there's a number of things that are happening in this very brief passage that's so familiar to us that we read at Christmas. We wish that Luke would, would have given us more information. In fact, it would be very interesting to have a book on these times right here. In fact, this year, 4 BC, would be very interesting to know all that was going on, but Luke doesn't do that. Uh, he just mentions this and he moves quickly. You'll see that on your... Um, PowerPoint slide and also on your handout, I suggest a different translation. Uh, your Bibles have this was the first registration. But there's a very plausible argument that it should be translated this was before the registration. The Greek word protos which is translated first, can function as an adjective. Um, it was um, before uh, the registration when Quirinius was governor. And I think that that's probably the best explanation for it. Uh, other than that, we don't know because Luke doesn't go into it. The before the registration according to this means we're talking about before the event that's recorded in Acts chapter 5. And why would he even make reference to that? Because all the readers knew about it. A registration for taxation in Judea, they will immediately think of the one that's recorded in Acts 5. And what he's telling them is this was before that. There actually was a, a, a census for taxation earlier, and that's what caused Joseph to take Mary to Bethlehem. This is what, what he is saying. Well, <clears throat> so they all went to be registered each to his own town. You see that? Each to his own town. 
Now, Mary and Joseph are from Nazareth. In fact, in Luke chapter 2, after um, they finish at the temple and they offer, you know, the offering in the temple and Simeon and Anna see the baby Jesus and all that we'll look at when we get to it. It says, Luke says, then they went to Nazareth to their own town. Now, if Nazareth was their own town and they have to be registered in their own town, then why weren't they registered in Nazareth? It would seem, as Luke goes on to explain here, uh, that Joseph had to go to Bethlehem uh, in fulfillment of the Roman requirement, which was according to the Jewish tradition, that you had to go to your ancestral town in order to be registered for this census. And he went there because he had more attachment to Bethlehem than just a 900 year old ancestor. All of these people had ancestors 900 years earlier, <laughs> but the town that they went to would be the town that had more closer relationship to them. What do we know here? In Luke 2, 4, uh, it says, Joseph went up from Galilee, uh, from Galilee, from the town of Nazareth, to Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David. It seems that the fact that Joseph was... We, we the scholarly term for descendants of David are Davidides. So he was a Davidide. Uh, he was of the royal house. And apparently for Jewish or Roman purposes, they wanted an accurate counting of those descendants. None of that house has had royal power for over 400 years, actually it's older, more than that, it's over 500 years, 600 years from this point. Uh, but there are all these prophecies, of course, regarding the house of David, and one would suspect that there are eyes that are being kept on that family. <laughs> Herod, of course, you know, reacts after he finds out that uh, the Messiah has been born in Bethlehem to kill all of the infant children there under two years old to make sure that there's nothing coming out of the house of David to challenge him and his authority. Is it possible that Joseph owned property in Bethlehem? There's no indication that he did. The fact that they offered the sacrifice in the temple. The poor sacrifice would indicate that he's not a wealthy man. However, he could have been part of the inheritance of some kind of property there in Jerusalem, in Bethlehem. And so that's why, you know, he went down there, needed to go there. At any rate, um, what we find out is where they go, apparently there's some kind of family connection. We can enlarge on this. When we were in Matthew, we noted how Matthew made a big deal about Nazareth, that they went to live in Nazareth because um, Matthew says, the Bible says that he will be called a Nazarene. Nazareth comes from the root word, not ser, which means ranch or root. Uh, and when, that's the prophecy in Isaiah 11, that a, a, a Nazareth, a branch, a shoot, will come off of the stump of Jesse, and to him will be given the kingdom. From that, it is uh, speculated that Nazareth, which was basically a new town, may have been populated by Davidides, um, in whose house that prophecy referred. They, they were the Nazareites. Okay, the branchites, and they they 
developed a new town called Nazareth. It's possible that um, that those people in Nazareth may have come from or had a number of connections to people in Bethlehem. We really would like Luke to tell us about that, <laughs> but he, he doesn't. So we just have the curious thing of, of Joseph. And if there were other Davidites in Nazareth, they may have formed a, a caravan or something to go down there for this registration purpose. And he's taking Mary with him. Notice how Luke says, Mary, his betrothed, uh, goes with him. And um, that's also interesting. There, there. Once again, I need to point out that there's absolutely nothing in the text of Scripture that indicates uh, kind of the modern preoccupation with um Mary's reputation, the fact that she's pregnant and she's going to give birth. There's there's nothing in the text that indicates there's any concern about this. When we were in Matthew, we noted that the angel told Joseph, when he informed Joseph that Mary um was going to conceive and um uh, and give birth to a son, the angel told him. Uh, to go ahead and take Mary as his wife. And uh, so he did. But Matthew tells us that they had no relations um, until Jesus was born. And when Luke tells you that he's taking Mary, his betrothed, I think that's from Joseph and Mary's standpoint that their relationship was as if they were still continuing the betrothal relationship. However, it's most likely that the, as far as externally is known, she is already formally his wife. So there's no issue that's raised by people about her being with him. In fact, because she's the wife, she needs to go down there to be registered also. And while they were there, the time came for her to give birth. And she gave birth to her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling cloths and laid him in a manger because there was no place for them in the inn. Well, of course, we say inn because that's how it's translated in the King James and in all subsequent translations. But it's probably not an inn. The better translation for the word would be the guest room. <laughs> they went to a house and there was no place for them in the guest room. So they stayed in the garage. Okay, That's what it is. So they were there with the animals, uh, which was the garage, you know, the donkey and so on. And some of these houses, they actually had um, kind of a half wall separating the we would say the garage from the rest of the house, or you'd go out through a door into that area of the house. So the animal would stay in there, and that's the only place in the house for them to be. And so the feeding trough, which was the manger, was made into a crib, and uh, she put the baby there. Notice she gave birth to her firstborn son. It was her firstborn son, which means that she had other children. And so there's this whole tradition in some theologies about how Mary was a perpetual virgin and so on. And so when it comes to this in the Gospels, there is that um, Catholics typically translate a passage such as in what is it? It's Luke uh, 8, where it talks about the other children. Mary and her other sons and daughters came to see Jesus, and they typically um, translate that as the cousins. These are Jesus' cousins. You know, Mary and her nieces and nephews came to see Jesus. 
But the text actually is Mary and her other sons and daughters. Okay. This is Jesus' brothers and sisters okay, that came to see it. Now we come to the second major part of this passage, and I'll read that. And in the same region, there were shepherds out in the fields, keeping watch over their flock by night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were filled with great fear. And the angel said to them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling cloths and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest and on earth peace among those with whom he is pleased. And when the angels went away from them into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let's go over to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has made known to us. And they went with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the baby lying in a manger. And when they saw it, they made known the saying that had been told them concerning this child. And all who heard it wondered at what had, the shepherds had told them. But Mary treasured up all these things, pondering them in her heart. And the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen as it had been told them. If you visit Israel um, and you go on tour, you most likely have gone down to Bethlehem. There in Bethlehem, you see um, the, the church that was built uh, there. So, so much happened there in, in uh, Christian history. We also will visit a cave where supposedly the shepherds were, or maybe even where the birth took place. By the way, <clears throat> was he born in a cave? Sometimes some people say in a cave. It's, it was possible if the house was built into the side of a hill, then part of it might have been considered a cave, but otherwise it was a house. But also, if you visit Bethlehem, you'll be taken out into the fields around Bethlehem, which are called the shepherd's fields. And the text says that it was in that region, the region of Bethlehem, the shepherds were keeping watch over their flock. Bethlehem fell within the circumference of uh, the Jerusalem temple, uh, the circumference in which flocks were kept for the temple to be offered uh, sacrificially in the temple. It's possible, very likely, that this these flocks that these shepherds were overseeing were temple flocks or offering in the temple. An angel of the Lord appeared to them and the glory of the Lord shone around them and they were filled with great fear. <clears throat> the glory of the Lord is, is a key feature in the Gospel of Luke. We're going to see key moments in the story where the glory of the Lord uh, is an important feature, the appearance of this glory. You're going to see it in the transfiguration of Jesus in Luke 9. You're going to see it appearing to the Apostle Paul on the road to Damascus in Acts 9 and repeated by Paul later in Acts as he recounts the story. But here uh, it is the glory of the Lord appearing to these shepherds. And uh, of course, they were fear filled with uh, fear that this would uh, appear to them this way. But the angel said, we don't know which angel. Earlier, we're told that Gabriel spoke to Zechariah. Gabriel spoke to Mary. We don't know whether this was Gabriel or some other angel. Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. This is the first appearance of the word good news, the phrase uh, from which we get the word gospel. For unto you is born this day, and note the phrase here, and I kind of rearranged it a little bit to, to more reflect the Greek. It's these four terms that are key, Savior, Christ, Lord, David. It's a Savior who is Christ, 
Lord. In the Greek, it's Christos, Kurios. It's Christ Lord. Or in order to say it in English, we have to put an article in there. So we put Christ the Lord uh, in, in the city of David. The word Savior uh, picks up the theme of salvation that Mary spoke about in the Magnificat and which Zechariah prophesied after the birth of John the Baptist, because they both speak of salvation that God is showing to the people of Israel. And this salvation is he's going to deliver them from their enemies. Um, and he's going to fulfill the promises that was made covenantally to the patriarchs. He's going to do all of this, and he's going to save his people, Israel. Well, the angel is announcing to this these shepherds that this is the one, this is the Savior who brings that salvation. We've been following in the infancy narratives the, this, um, this kind of back and forth, it's focus on John the Baptist, focus on Jesus, focus on John the Baptist, focus on Jesus. And there is this, this ascending progression of importance here because John is the forerunner, but Jesus is the one he comes before. Jesus is the one, Jesus is the Lord here. So he is the, uh, John announces that salvation is coming. Jesus is the savior. He is the Christ. This is the first time in the gospel that this term is used of him. Uh, he is also Lord, which is very interesting. And it becomes the word, the key word in the rest of the, of the um, New Testament. Both terms, Christ and Lord, Christ, especially when we get to the uh, epistles and the term Lord. Later in the gospel, when Jesus gets finally gets to Jerusalem, the week of the crucifixion, he will have that encounter with the rulers there in Jerusalem, and he will ask them, whose son is the Christ? And they say, he is the son of David. <clears throat> and he asks him, how is it then in the 110th Psalm that David calls him his Lord? And he didn't know what to say. That psalm then becomes the most cited psalm in the rest of the New Testament. This, this is who he is. He's David's son, but he is the Lord at the right hand of the Lord. Which is also connected to that curious prophecy in Malachi. We had finished Malachi before we were coming to Luke. And right at the end of Malachi is this prophecy of the forerunner. And um, the, the strange way in which it, it reads uh, is kind of like a riddle because it says, uh, Malachi 3.1, Behold, I send my messenger and he will prepare the way before me. This is God speaking. And then we have this, and suddenly he, notice this is God speaking, I I'm going to send my messenger who will prepare the way before me. And then suddenly he will come. And he will come to his temple. And the temple is only the temple of one. It's the temple of God. And he will come to his temple, the Lord whom you seek. Who is also the messenger of the covenant in whom you delight. Behold, he is coming, says the Lord of hosts. There is a Lord who's coming. The temple is his. But it's the Lord who's telling you that the Lord is coming. And Malachi doesn't explain it. And then you get to, to Luke and you have... Gabriel telling Zechariah that he's going to have a son who will prepare the way before the Lord. And, uh, and you have Gabriel telling Mary that her son is going to be the son of the Most High. And here you have the angel telling the shepherds 
that the Christ who has just been born is also the Lord. Not unpacking it at this point, just presenting it there at the beginning of the gospel to be unpacked as the gospel goes on. So then there is this multitude of heavenly hosts praising God, saying glory to God in the highest on earth, peace to favored men or among favored men, meaning men and women. The angels went away into heaven. The shepherds said, let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that's happened, which the Lord has made known to us. And they went with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the baby lying in a manger. And when they saw the baby, they made known the saying that had been told them concerning this child. In other words, they told him, they, they told Mary and Joseph and whatever other family members that were there, because remember, they're in a house. And they're in the garage because the guest room is full of other family members, okay? So uh, whoever is in there to see the baby, of course they were in there to see the baby. When a baby's born, everybody comes to see it, okay? So they're all in there. And here come these shepherds saying, the angel said that he is a savior. He is Christ, the Lord. And they all wondered but Mary treasured up all these things, pondering them in her heart. I am pretty sure that Mary was an obvious source for Luke. Remember he said that he searched all these things out? He would have talked to Mary. <clears throat> Mary was there through the whole gospel story, even at the cross. Mary was there in Acts chapter 1 after Jesus ascended into heaven with the disciples who were gathered in the upper room. Luke tells you that she was there. I suppose that Mary was there uh, a part of the knowledge group of this disciples from the, all their experiences of Jesus, what they heard him say and so on. She was there with what she knew, contributing to that knowledge of those early set of believers. And part of that, because she treasured it up in her heart, was that he was announced from heaven as the Savior, as Christ the Lord. And you connect that to what Gabriel told her personally, that he would be given the throne of his father David, and he would reign over his kingdom forever. She knew all that. And she shared those things. And the shepherds returned glorifying and praising God for all they had seen and heard as it had been told them. Which means that in Bethlehem, here in 4 BC, there is a rather distinct knowledge of who he is that was shared by a group of people. So when we fast forward 30 years and we have John the Baptist and his ministry, and then we have Jesus and his ministry, there, there already is knowledge down there of these events. At the end of eight days, when he was circumcised, he was called Jesus. Just as with John the Baptist, named at the time of the circumcision, on the eighth day, the name given by the angel before he was conceived in the womb. Well, that is our text for today. And we'll pause and find your comments, thoughts, observations as we... Uh, include our time today. Very familiar passage, but very important here at the beginning of the gospel story on understanding who Jesus is, what his purpose and what his destiny. Jesus, who is declared by heaven to be the Messiah, to be the Lord, 
during the time that Rome has its first emperor, <laughs> the most powerful man on the earth, but the eyes of heaven are focused on Bethlehem. Your thoughts, observations, comments, reflections? Yes, Barbara? As you pointed out, this is so familiar that we overlook something very important. And you just pointed out, he was announced from heaven. Jesus announced as the Christ in mm his -hmm. life. Yeah. He was the Christ the Lord. So, again, my question is, why... Is this only not in right now? I know yeah. things are going to change. Right into that. It, you know, Barbara, it does raise that question. Barbara's question, Zoomer, is, the Zoomers, is that, um, you know, with this announcement from heaven, uh, I mean, it can't be any more explicit as to who he is. And then to, to see Israel... Um, not recognizing him uh, is is an incredible enigma, uh, you know. And all I can say is that this, you know, you go to Paul in Romans nine to eleven, where Paul raises this issue and says, you know, it's it's really unfathomable that this is the case. And so Paul ends, uh, you know, in Romans eleven, saying, of course, you know, there will be a time when they do recognize him. But as far as <clears throat> All this being the case of this blindness that's now, Paul ends by saying, you know, acknowledging the inscrutable ways of God. Uh, his ways are inscrutable. Um, I mean, that's all you can say. Uh, you know, it's just baffling. But it's all part of the plan of God by which Salvation has come to Gentiles. You have all these Gentiles coming to know the Lord. Um, but the time will come when Israel does know him. But he, and so because of that, I want to just mention this point. We're in Luke chapter two. So in Acts chapter two, I mean, you got two books here, Luke, Acts. You've, and we pointed out all these parallels between the beginning of Luke and the beginning of Acts, beginning of the gospel and the beginning of Acts. So in Acts chapter two, you have Peter in Jerusalem saying, let all the house of Israel know he's preaching in Jerusalem that the Lord God has made him Lord and Christ. And so, and, and a number do respond. There are a number who do respond, you know, at that time. So, you know, there's always this remnant, but these are the mysterious ways of God, one has to say. Gary? Um, and it goes dark a little bit. Uh, I, I, I just heard a little also um, an interlude at the end of Acts talks about the law of Moses and the covenant, preaching that, not just, and I mean, you get back and you talk about how the Gentiles are included because of all the prophets and how they're used to the Gentile. Um, what I'm interested in is that when in, in, in Acts chapter two, you have all these kings and emperors and governors that are alluded to. I keep going back to Daniel chapter two, like, 35 through 42, talking about the, the setup of the kingdom. And I want to know, I want to know specifically if, if the kingdom is actually set up, okay? Not so much maybe established, but set up with the birth and the growth and um, with the gospel going on. In, in Acts and also in Luke, are we going back to Daniel chapter two? Is this a? I mean, this is a. This is a. Is this? What? I mean, is this what yeah. we're talking about? Well, remember that uh, my favorite term on prophecy: the term complexification. Uh, so uh, this is 
you know, actually your question is very good. And in terms of, as we go through Luke and we go to Acts, we want to follow this kingdom thing. So what we have so far is that he is the Christ. So, um, and I often tell people, you know, how, how much do you have to have in order to have a kingdom? Well, the one indispensable thing you have to have is a king, <laughs> okay? And his realm can be far or wide, can be narrow or small, whatever, but you got to have that. So what you have is you have elements of this that are appearing. And the first thing you have appearing is the king himself. But let's follow that out as we go through Acts and we go into, uh, we'll go through Luke and we go into Acts. Because what you see is a is a revealing and appearing of the kingdom in terms of aspects. I think, without getting into it, because we don't have any time on this, but uh, the parable that Jesus gave of the mustard seed and the leaven and so on is illustrating, he says, this is about the kingdom. And what it indicates is a very small beginning. But then you have this growth. You have these stages that appear until you get to the final thing that in its fullness that was predicted. We'll have to see how that works itself out. But the answer lies in there. Let me go to Michael. Uh, you got your hand up there, Michael, over in Thailand. Over in Thailand. Yeah, it's already after midnight here. But yeah, um, yeah I have a question. Actually, I'm going to email you on it because it's a longer question. I don't want to take up the time. I might just shoot you an email. But, you know, you mentioned the complexity. And I mean, I am Jewish. Um, you know, both my parents and younger sister, they've all passed on to my knowledge. None of them came to faith as far as I know. But you know, my one sister, and she just, you know, as she will say that there's no such thing as a Messianic Jew, because Jews by nature, well, Jews just don't believe in Jesus. And it's, um, you know, just, it's just, you know, the, they're all blinded to that. Yeah, uh, <clears throat> that is a common response among uh, number of Jews. In fact, the organization Jews for Jesus likes to use that as a as a uh, conundrum to open up the conversation. Jews believing in Jesus? Uh, you know, how can that be? And yet, <clears throat> when we read um, Luke, we read Acts, these are all Jews. <laughs> uh, and, you know, Jesus, his family, and all of the events of the Gospels, and even in Acts, and we mentioned a while ago, the people who responded in Jerusalem in Acts 2, and then again in Acts uh, 4, the number of people who respond are all Jews, and they're increasing. It's all Jewish believers in Jesus. And um, so, yes, there is this conundrum, but in actual fact... <laughs> And uh, you are an example of it yourself, Michael, of, uh, of the fact that it is true that there are Jewish believers in Jesus because the story is not complete yet. And we live in, in that ongoing story. Well, we come, we're past our time and we need to go ahead and close today. Next week, we will continue in Luke's, Luke 2, looking at uh, what the Lord has for us in these very familiar passages of scripture. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for the grace of God that you granted to us in sending your son, Jesus. Lord, when we read the gospels, we see those aspects of the times which undoubtedly filled most people's attention, those great political events of the time and the people of power, and the rulers, we find in our own time that uh, our people are focused on the those who hold power and exercise it in our own times and our own day. And yet the plan and the purpose of God is manifest in your son. And thank you, Lord, for the gift of life, of forgiveness, redemption and healing and the hope of a kingdom that is everlasting 
in and through him. Please grant to us wisdom as we continue to study these things. We pray that the Lord will be honored in and through us as we seek to walk with you by faith in this week. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.